with Christmas My lighthouse gave to me Twelve readers green Eleven kids at kidding Ten p.m. communion Nine teens attempting Eight feeders feeding Seven ushers seating Six babies bouncing Five singers singing Four Christmas songs Three ways of giving to God And Christmas concert
casting every care on you. I have carried them enough. We're not alone here within his love. Amen.
waiting for a breakthrough. You've been waiting for God to clear out a, a situation or a circumstance. You've been waiting for a really, really long time. I don't know how long your season of waiting is going to be or how long it needs to be, but I can guarantee you this one thing, that God is a way maker. That even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, that he's making a way. He is orchestrating things here and there, not only with yourself, but with others that you don't even know. So I'm encouraging you to, to hold on to that hope, to hold on to that, to grasp onto it. Let that be your lifeline, that God is here to make a way for you. Do not be discouraged because he will never leave you nor forsake you that he will make a way. But he requires our obedience to continue to walk in that path and to walk in his way. So don't, don't be discouraged as you're in here today. Declare his name, worship his name, thank him for all that he has done, for his amazing grace that we will call upon his name. And that here in the presence that when we are tired of running, that we can be still and know that he is God. Together this morning.
hand is not too short that it can't reach. But we believe in you. There's nothing impossible with you, God. You're a way maker. Way Your God today. Who is he? Who is he to you?
sickness flee. Because that's who he is. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Rise up our feet, God. Release the spirit of faith in us, Lord God. We come against every doubt right now. Every doubt, every unbelief right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you are God. So that we believe that you is. And you're a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. Lord, we thank you that you are a rewarder. That you hear our prayers. And we know if you hear them, you will answer. financial breakthrough and I'm just going to ask the ushers to come forward and while they're coming I just want to remind us that um, this week is the last Sunday to give towards um, Pastor's Christmas offering and then uh, I think next week we'll be uh, presenting that so if you haven't given today's your last day so you can you know, get, put it in on, on the envelope, give to the ushers. Also, there's a um, poinsettia memorial. There are um, the big ones. I think there's 13 left. First come, first serve. And it comes with a donation. I think it's of $10. And um, you could get, um, you know, just a, a tag put on it for your loved one. No, that's not here in this season just for a memorial so um, with that you could just um, I think you get an envelope from the welcome center and you can put it in the give it to the ushers and then they'll they'll take care of that amen amen so we're gonna pray today for the offering and as you give today give in faith give believe in that our God is a way maker. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you today that there is a financial breakthrough coming. Lord God, the cattle on a thousand hills are yours. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Everything and everyone that's in it. Lord, you have created all resources. Silver, gold, diamonds. Lord, there's nothing that's not at your disposal. Lord, you said you only give us even hidden treasures. Treasures that's been hid. Tisha. I command the enemy right now in the name of Jesus take your hands off the kingdom's finance take your hands off the kingdom's finance in the name of Jesus it's not yours the wealth of the wicked are laid up for the just Lord I thank you that there's gonna be a transfer <laughs> There's going to be a transfer, mm. financial transfer into the kingdom. Lord, I thank you for that. And we believe in you for that, God. Because we know that your kingdom has glory and splendor. Lord, help us to get our heart in that place. So we can truly be a vessel to be used financially to send forth the kingdom and the gospel to the world. Lord, we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, as the ushers go for it. Amen. And we're just going to have Pastor to come up.
They must be having problems with the video this morning. Good morning. God bless all of you. I'm so excited to bring the word to you this morning. <clears throat> I actually have two messages for you today. The first message is prophetic in nature. I was looking around this morning and and we were singing that song, Waymaker. I just kind of looked around the congregation and I, I saw a lot of you that you were just kind of like standing there looking around, observing. It's like you were not really in, involved. I could tell you just weren't there. You were distracted. And the word that God gave me on Friday for you was to tell you, do not be distracted. I've been dealing with some stuff in, in, in the church, at Lighthouse Church, and I've been dealing with stuff in, outside of the church, and our nation has been dealing with stuff. You know, there's this huge impeachment thing going on with the president, and every time you turn the news on, the TV, you know, it's, he said, she said, we're going to, you know, it's all that stuff going on. And it's just, it's just all over the place. And then I had to deal with three situations in the last three weeks that had to do with a trial of a, an erring minister, had to do with a situation with our youth pastor, had to do with uh, people, Lord, that, that were dealing with stuff in our church where it was absorbing so much emotional energy and time for me and I've just been saying God all this stuff is going on you're trying to speak to me you're trying to say something to me I don't want to miss it what are you saying and <clears throat> I got a text message right when I was praying that prayer it was in here walking and praying and I got a text message from somebody who is uh you know, gifted in the prophetic in our congregation, and they didn't even know that I was praying this, and the text message said, and I don't know if you're here this morning, if you're watching online, you'll, you'll know who it is when I, when I say it, but uh, you'll know who you are, but the text said, the church is distracted, and when they sent that text message to me, it hit me right between the eyes, and God said, this is a message I'm wanting you to see. This is what's going on in your nation. This is what's going on in your church. This is what's going on in the world. The devil is trying to distract us. Just look at the situation that's going on in Congress right now. For months, day after day, hour after hour, session after session, the whole Congress of the United States, the whole Senate, they have been focused on a trial for the president. And I'm not saying I'm, I have no political investment here. I'm not saying that's, that's wrong, that's right, and nothing about president or our leaders. Simply saying this, all the energy and all the time that's going into this, and there are major issues in our country that are not being dealt with. Because all the time is being spent on he said, she said. And God just spoke to me and said, that's how the devil works. He gets you distracted and tied up in things that you think are important. And maybe even they are important things. Maybe they're even church things. Maybe they're even things that, that are spiritual. But we, what, what happens is the enemy will use them to suck the energy, suck the life, suck the time out of you. And while you are so busy doing these things you think are so important, there are people lost going to hell all around you. And God said, tell the church, do not be distracted. Keep your focus on him. Keep your eyes on the mission. 
We are here to worship God and to serve him. We are here to win souls for the kingdom of God. We are here to give our passion to him. Our purpose is people, and help people find their purpose. And we are here to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission. Do not take your eyes off the prize. Amen. Okay? Amen. Amen. Don't let the devil steal one moment of what God wants you to do and what God wants us to do. If you look at Christmas time and you look at the first coming of Jesus, how the devil seen that something big was coming down the pipe and he tried his best to distract Israel, to distract the world, the Maccabean revolt and all kind of things that took place during those times. That's why the Jews celebrate Hanukkah. You should study that this week. And, and, and see how that many distractions. The devil knows when God's up to something good and he will try his best to distract us so that we miss it. And many people miss the first coming of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, Jesus Christ is coming back a second time and the devil wants to distract us from that. we got to keep our eyes on the skies. That's the first message. <laughs> And the second one kind of ties in it because this morning we're talking about the, we're, we're talking about the third home of Jesus. So if you'll stand with me and open your Bible apps and your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And we'll also be reading from Revelation chapter 21. 2 Peter chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 21. Ooh. Thank you, Lord. When you found it, say amen. I'll wait. There's a lot of you still looking. And while you're looking, let me just welcome those who are watching online. Wherever you are this morning, I'm glad that you're here and that you're watching and God's going to speak to you. You just stay there. Don't change the channel. Don't turn off the live stream. You're going to be glad that you waited because God has a great word for us this morning. I have been so anticipating preaching these, this message for the last few days. This is the third and final of our Christmas series. We're talking about the three homes of Christ. That first home was that Jesus came from heaven. We talked about how Jesus didn't begin in the manger in Bethlehem. He pre-existed. He is the pre-incarnate Christ. He existed before all things. He created all things. That Jesus is God and he has always existed. And then we talked about the second home of Jesus. And that was, so we had the pre-incarnate Christ. And, and last week, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we talked about the incarnate Christ. How that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And made this earth his second home. He lived here among us for 33 years. And John said, we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then uh, at, the, at the conclusion of the message last week, we saw that Jesus fulfilled his purpose of coming to earth and making it his second home when he died for our sins. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave victorious three days later. Yes. Amen? Yes. And he ascended. He ascended to heaven, which is where we're going to pick up today. Because Jesus is right now in his first home. And he has a third home he's coming to. In 1 Peter, or sec, I'm sorry, I said 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, begin reading in verse 10. I've got to tell you, I have never preached this message or used these texts in a Christmas sermon, and I've been preaching for like 37 years. And it's not that I'm that old. I started like when I was four or something, but <laughs> I can't remember. No, I didn't, but uh, 
I've never preached this, and I'm excited to preach it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. In the context, Peter is talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord refers to the end of the end. Not the last days, but the last day. The end, when God brings it all to a great conclusion. And he picks up in the middle of this uh, uh, writing in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by what? Fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you, turn to your neighbor and say he's talking about you, ought you to be well I'll tell you you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by what fire and the elements will melt in the heat but in keeping with his promises, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Can you say praise God? Praise God. Praise God. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Him is God. And bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Thank you for your word this morning. Now turn over to Revelation chapter 21. The last two chapters of the Bible. The last three chapters of the Bible describe for us how everything is going to come together in the end. And in chapter 21, John in his vision of the end, sees, he gets to see heaven come to earth. He gets to see the new heaven. He gets to see the new earth. He gets to see it in a vision. An angel takes him on a tour. And he said, uh, let's go in verse, pick up in verse 10. And he carried me away. He is the he is the angel. He carried me away in the spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, to a mountain great and high. And speaking of this, it, it ends for John on a mountain. And next Sunday, we're going to talk about from manger to mountain. It's a great musical presentation. I want you to invite everybody. Let's pack this place out, and people are going to hear about from the manger to the mountain next week. So here is John ending on the mountain. And he says, he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. This is the new Jerusalem. This is where Jesus said he was going to prepare a place for us. This is what he's building for us. And it's coming to the earth. The new Jerusalem is coming to the earth. And John sees it coming down. It says that there were three gates on the there were three gates on the east, on the north, on the south, on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations on them with the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold and measured the city, its gates, and its walls. And it was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. It measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia. That's 1,400 miles, folks, in length and as width and as high as it is a 1,400-mile cubed city, 1,400 miles high, layer after layer after layer. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's huge. And look at the city. The walls was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. 
And the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. And he begins to list them, Jasper, Sapphire, Chalcedon, Emerald, Sardinx, Carnelian, Chrysolite, Beryl, Topaz, Chrysophy. He goes on, and then he says, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Are you getting that? A 1,400-mile-high pearl. I'd like to see that oyster. Obviously, this was created by God's hand, not an oyster's hand, right? 1,400 miles. The gates are made of pearls, each made of a single pearl. And the great street of the city was pure gold like a transparent glass. Isn't that beautiful? And he goes on to describe this city. And let me just keep reading. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that's Jesus, are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations, what nations? The nations on the new earth will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Folks, this is describing our forever home. This is the third home. Father, I thank you for your word right now, and I pray that you... <laughs> thank you, Lord. I am overwhelmed this morning with your word. So I'm having a hard time this morning emotionally. Help me to hold it together, God, so I can proclaim this precious hope of the soon coming of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you're seated. Jesus is right now at his first home. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? People say, well, you know, Jesus is here. Jesus is with us. I know we tell our children, you know, Jesus is in your heart. Make sure you have Jesus in your heart. You can talk to Jesus in your heart. You can pray Jesus. But, and there is a, there is a, there is a theological truth in the fact that, remember, Jesus is God, right? And as God, one of the characteristics of God is that he is omnipresent. God is everywhere present at all times. There's no place where you can go where Jesus does not see, does not know, does not understand. He sees it all, what's hidden in secret, what's openly revealed. Jesus is everywhere and sees all. And in that sense, we can say that Jesus is with us. But the resurrected body, of Jesus Christ is not here on this earth. He ascended up into heaven where he now sits on the throne. That's where Jesus is. In Acts 7 and 48 it says, God does not dwell in men's hands, right? In temples made with men's hands. So we know that he does not dwell here. He does not dwell in a building. He dwells by his spirit in our hearts. He sent his Holy Spirit into the world. When Jesus ascended, just before he left, he met with his disciples and said, I'm going to the Father. I'm going to leave you. But I'm not going to leave you alone. Because if I go to the Father, he will send another comforter, the Holy Spirit. One of the names or titles of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ. And so he ascended to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit. And now in this dispensation of spirit, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And from that day forward, we have the Holy Spirit literally, not just with you, Jesus said in John 15, but he shall be within you. He is in us. His Holy Spirit is living in us. That's the work of God in the earth. The Holy Spirit is here in the work. I just preached a whole series of sermons on that, so you, you know what I'm talking about. But where's Jesus? Jesus is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven with the Father. Bible says in Mark 16 and verse 19, after Jesus spoke to them, he was taken up into heaven. 
where he sat at the right hand of God. In our text, we read in verse 22 in 1 Peter 3, that he who has gone into the heavens is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. Jesus is on the throne. The angels and all the authorities and powers are submitted to him. He is controlling what is going on in this world right now from heaven. And there are many passages I could read to you declaring that Jesus is in heaven. Where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's on the throne in heaven. And just as Jesus, you say, if Jesus is in heaven, what is he doing? What is he doing in heaven? That's a good question. And the Bible gives us at least three answers for sure that we know that Jesus is doing in heaven. And the first thing is, the Bible says that Jesus is in heaven interceding for us. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, listen to this verse. Who then is condemned? Is condemned? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is making intercession for us. The writer of Hebrews said, he is forever making intercession for us. The writer of Hebrews says that we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities and he is our intercessor. He is the mediator between God and God. And man, aren't you excited that Jesus is praying and interceding and going to the Father on your behalf in heaven? Amen. I'm telling you, I'm so glad for a praying mother and praying grandmother and grandfather that brought me to where I am today, but even more powerful. I've got Jesus, the Son of God. He's praying for me. He's interceding for me. He knows what's going on in my life. And he has access at the throne of heaven to do something about it. Hallelujah. The second thing that Jesus is doing is he is busy preparing. In John chapter 14, he told his disciples just nights before his death, he said, I am going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place. And we read about that place in our text in Revelation 22. Jesus is building a city. He's preparing a city who, as the Bible says in Hebrews 11, whose builder and maker is God, the new Jerusalem. That's what Abraham looked forward to. That's what the prophets saw in the vision. That's where our hearts should be attached to. You should not be attached to any earthly home on this planet. Your heart and your home should be for the new Jerusalem, the new city that Jesus himself is preparing for you. Right now, while you're sitting here, Jesus is preparing a place for you. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions I am going to prepare one just for you. God's preparing, he's building, he's working, he's building a house for you in the new Jerusalem so that where I am, there you may be also. I'm sorry, I'm getting too loud. I'm just got to calm down this morning. Just chill, Lane, just chill. Mm. And I get to thinking about what's coming. <laughs> Woo, suddenly all the troubles I have in this life just get so small. You know what I'm saying? And that's why, that's why he said, keep your eyes to the skies. Keep looking up to the hills, right? Because what's coming is so much greater than the pain that you're experiencing right now. I'm telling you, it's going to be worth it, folks. And the third thing that Jesus is doing is he's waiting. He's waiting. In Matthew 24, Jesus was talking about the end of the world and the end of time and his second coming. And he was asked, when will these things take place? And Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, but the Father. So if you can picture this morning that Jesus is sitting in heaven on the throne, and here is God the Father, and Jesus is looking up and saying, is it time yet? 
I want to go get my kids. I got the house ready. I want to go get my family. My sons, my daughters are down there. They're suffering in that darkness of the earth. I want to go get them and bring them into the new Jerusalem. I can't wait. Is it time yet? And God just says, no, not yet. Because there's some people down there in Plainfield that need Jesus. And they haven't got Jesus yet. We just got to wait a little bit longer. And then Jesus looks up and says, Father, another day. Is it time yet? Can I go yet? Is, is it time? I want to go get, I want to go get my children. And God looks at Jesus and says, no, it's not time yet. Because there's some prodigal children from some people at Lighthouse Church have been praying for their kids to come home. And I'm just waiting a little bit longer because I want them to come home. I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Just wait a little longer. There's some sinners. There's some praying mothers. There's some praying fathers. There's some weeping brothers and sisters. I hear their prayers coming up as a smoke before me. And I am waiting for my judgment because I want everybody to come in who's going to come in. And he's waiting and he's waiting. But there's going to be a day. When Jesus looks at the Father and Father says, go and get your sons and daughters and Jesus is going to come back to this earth again. Hallelujah. Yes. So he's waiting. He's waiting for us. He's waiting. He's waiting for God to release him to come the second time. Because let's talk about the second coming of Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to come back to the earth again. And, you know, there's different things in eschatology. There's the rapture. There's the millennial. There's the second coming and all this stuff. And I don't want to get into eschatological sermon. We'll teach that at another time. What I want to really focus on this morning is I want to focus on the second coming of Jesus. When he comes back to stay, when he comes back to live with us, when he comes back to stay with us, this will be our forever home. Now, in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was ascending, it says, after that, he was taken up before them, before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. This is Acts 1 and 9. And he goes on to say, they were looking intently up into the sky when suddenly two men appeared to them and said, men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that you see ascending shall come again in the same way that he, you see him leave. Jesus is coming back. From the time he left, it was addressed. Jesus talked about it himself in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and verse 30. He says, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see him. Why? Because they're going to realize when they see Jesus that they have missed him. That everything those crazy Christians have been saying about Jesus all these years is true. And here he is coming back, and I'm not ready, and I've missed it. They're going to mourn. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, Look, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, and ev even those who have pierced him. And all the people on the earth will mourn because of him. Paul talked about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17. He described it this way. He said, for the Lord himself, Jesus, shall descend from heaven with a shout. Hey, I believe he's sitting on the throne and God says, it's time. He says, yeah, <laughs> I think that's the shout. <laughs> With the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ, when they hear that trumpet, when they hear that voice, they are going to rise up from their graves and meet the Lord in the air. But listen, it says, Then those of us who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord shall join them in the air. We will be caught up to be with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? I'm looking forward to that day, the second coming of Jesus. 
Now Jesus, when he comes the second time, it's going to be a lot different than when he came the first time. <clears throat> and right now at Christmas, we're all talking about the first coming of Jesus to the earth. But the second coming will be different. When Jesus came the first time, he was coming here temporarily. When he comes the next time, he's coming here eternally. When Jesus came the first time, he was only seen by a few people. A few shepherds on the hillside were announced his coming. A few wise men traveling across the desert were announced his coming. A handful of people in, in Bethlehem saw and announced of his coming. But the Bible says that when Jesus comes a second time, every eye will see him and everyone will behold him. Everybody will see him as the skies open up and Jesus comes back for us. The first time he came, he came to Jerusalem riding on the fold, the colt of an ass, a lowly king. But the second time he comes back, he's going to be riding on a white horse with a crown, of th crown on his head and he's going to have an iron scepter in his hands to reign. Hallelujah. The first time that he came, Guess what? They mocked him, and with their mouth they made fun of him, and they abused him. But the Bible says that when he comes back the second time, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. The first time that he came back, he came back to resurrect himself from the dead. But the second time he comes back, he's coming back to resurrect me from the dead, to resurrect you from the dead. And death will have no more power over us. Hallelujah. I'm about to get excited. First time he came, he came as the Lamb of God. The second time he's coming as the Lion of Judah. Friend, listen, you may have not been around the first coming. You may have missed the first coming of Jesus, but you don't want to miss the second coming of Jesus. He's coming and he's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth. Let's talk about that. The Old Testament prophets, the gospels, the epistles, the apocryphal literature all give us glimpses, visions from God of what this new heaven and this new earth are going to be like. And I, I think this is important that we understand that. I want you to be doctrinally sound as a church, you know? How we believe, what we believe is so important because how we believe is how we act, right? So it's important that you get this because, you know, a lot of Christians believe that when you die... You go to heaven to be with Jesus, and you're going to be in heaven forever with Jesus. That's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. When we die, we do go to heaven. Our body returns to the dust. Our spirit goes to God from where it came from, from heaven. And we're there with Jesus, with the saints, with God in heaven. And it's a wonderful place, but it's just an apartment. It's just a temporary condition position. It's just, it's just a temporary holding place. The Bible says that we have an eternal home, a forever home that comes later. And it doesn't come until the second coming of Jesus. And the forever home is going to be this earth. It's going to be this place where you live right now. It's going to be the same earth, because the Bible says the earth will endure forever, but it's going to be a different earth. Jesus is going to come back, and he is going to redo the earth. Peter describes this process in our text, and it's kind of dark, and it's kind of scary. But the first thing that Jesus does when he comes back is he does a cleansing of the earth. And you know, this has happened before. The earth got so, so sinful that God had to destroy it with water in what's called the, the flood of Noah's day. Remember the story of the flood? 
And after that flood, God made a promise and a covenant with us that he would never destroy the earth again by water. And he put a bow, a rainbow in the sky as a sign for us to remember that promise. But that doesn't mean he will never destroy the earth again. The Bible is very specific. He is going to destroy the earth again, but this time not by water, but by fire. And Peter describes what other prophets described in the scripture, that at that great day of the Lord, at the end of this world, that the whole elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The sky is melting. The earth is melted. It is consumed. You've heard me say it many times. It's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. And God is going to re Create. The Re book of Revelation describes this judgment as the day of the Lord in terrible details. If you read verses chapters 4 through chapters 18 in the book of Revelation, there is a description of the last seven years of the world and what it's going to be. It's going to be horrendous. You don't want to be here, I promise you. You don't want to be here. The plagues, the, the vile judgments, the trumpet judgments, the things that are coming that this world has... It will get so bad that there will be hardly anybody left alive or anything left alive or anything left green on the earth. It's all going to be burned and destroyed in the judgment of God. Remember that Jesus created the earth. We read that in Colossians, how that everything that is, he created. Remember that in the beginning was the word, Jesus. And in Genesis 1, we saw the word speak and said, let there be. He created the earth. And when, when God created the earth, it was perfect. He said, it is good. There was no death. There was no dying. There was no disease, there was no decay, there was no destruction. There was just the presence of God coming to be with man. And he made this earth and he put us in it and gave us authority over it. And it was paradise, the Garden of Eden. But what happened? We know what happened. Satan showed up in the Garden of Eden and he deceived Adam and Eve. The representatives, the first humans, and every human that ever came from the earth came from them. And he, Satan said, if I can destroy them, if I can, if I can bring sin into their life, I will have destroyed the earth and the human race. And that's just what he did. He tempted Eve. Eve ate. She gave to Adam. He ate. They sinned. They rebelled against the very word that God had spoken them. Do not eat. And they ate. And that rebellion against God and that sin caused death and the curse to come into the world. And the world and mankind has been on a downward spiral for thousands of years ever since then. And I know you look at, this, at the TV and you go to school and they're teaching some of the teenagers in school, they're teaching you global warming, right? And how that the atmosphere and, and all this and the solar and how all these things, we got to save the planet or it may be too late. Listen, I want to tell you, you say, Pastor, do you believe in global warming? Oh, yes, I believe in global warming. And Jesus has a much different version of global warming. He's going to send fire, rain fire and brimstone down upon the earth it's going to get real hot. This is much more serious than ice caps melting, friends, what we're facing. And this is what God said is going to happen. And it's not going to be the devil doing it. It's going to be God doing it as he comes to cleanse and to purify from evil and sin and unrighteousness. And he's doing that to prepare a new world for us. You know that, right? And in fact, in the New Testament, it describes Satan as the little g God of this world. That right now, Satan, man gave up his authority over this earth. And now there's the kingdoms of darkness and there's the, there's the kingdoms of men and, 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 and there's darkness all over the earth. You see it everywhere. It reminds me of a story. Something very true. And maybe you can relate to that. I wasn't living in Connecticut during 
the Great Recession that started about 2009, I was in North Carolina. And we had it there too. But a friend of mine by the name of Tommy Zito, he's an evangelist, and he's been here. Uh, he was, I remember, I'll never forget him telling me uh, that he had just been assigned to a congregation called Fort Myers, the light, it's the Church of God congregation there in Fort Myers, Florida. And he went there, uh, they sent him there, the Church of God sent him there because uh, the church had had a big division and split, and it was a huge church, and it was just withering away, and they needed somebody with evangelistic gifts that could go in there and win souls and build that church back up. So he, he took that assignment. I remember him telling me how that when he went to Fort Myers, and he was driving around and praying over the city, that he would go in these subdivisions near his church where there were gated communities, where there were big half million and million dollar beautiful mansions and homes. And he would drive down the roads and entire blocks would be empty houses because of foreclosures from the bank. Remember, that's what started this big recession was these adjusted rate, these armed mortgages, right? And all these people, the banks were just giving out mortgages to anybody and everybody. And then when the rates went up because they were adjusted, they went sky high. And millions of people all over the United States lost their homes. They were foreclosed. And it was a, it was a tragic time because the domino effect of that went right down, all the way down into everybody's jobs and everything. It was a, it was a dark time. You remember that? Most of you were alive and, and went through that. It was, a, it was a hard time. But here were all these houses. And he says, it looked like a ghost town. It was scary. And they all had these, these signs on the windows, you know, that said, by the department, by the state, you know. There were eviction notices that were on the doors. Uh, uh, do not come in. Do not enter. And he says, it was so sad. It was like apocalyptic. It got hit so bad there in Fort Myers. He said, what happened is, is that the homeless population, and specifically the drug population, because, you know, not everybody that's homeless is on drugs, right? There's people that are homeless because they're in a bad situation. But there was, there was a mean part. Let's, put, let's say there was a mean part of the homeless that were there, and they found out about all these empty houses, and they went and squatted there. They went and moved into these half million dollar and million dollar homes. <laughs> they had no electricity, they had no water, but they had shelter and they were living in these big fancy homes like they were, like they were kings, you know, and they had nothing. And of course, as the bank began to sell these homes, the people and the owners of the home would come with their key and they would open up the door and they would find out that there was somebody living in the house that they had bought. And they had to get them out of there, and they, some of them were, this was on the news, you know, some of them were using squatters' rights and all that kind of stuff, and there was a war kind of, so what happened is, a lot of these squatters, when they, when they got evicted, they found out that they were going to have to leave the house, they trashed the house, they took spray paint, and they painted the walls, they tore chandeliers down. They tore cabinets out of the walls. They busted all the mirrors and the glass. They defecated and urinated on the carpets. And it, they left, they, they just trashed the house and left it. And can you imagine, you just bought a great deal on a beautiful million dollar home and you open the door and it's just trashed. And you have to just gut it out and start all over again. And as I thought of Christmas and I thought of Jesus coming to the earth, I remember that he was here when there was the grand opening. <laughs> he was the one who created it. And when he made it, it was so beautiful. And, and he was there with Adam and Eve and he presented the keys to them and said, here, I give you dominion over the earth. You're going to move in. Take care of it. Take good care of this beautiful home that I have built for you. And then he left. And what happened is, is that man sinned and messed up. We just talked about it. And he gave his keys over to Satan. And Satan has been squatting on this earth for 2,000 years at least. Or for 4,000 years, Satan had been squatting and havoc. And can you imagine how Jesus felt when he came to the earth the second time only to discover that there was darkness 
all over. There was sin all over. There was evil all over. People were abusing him. People were lying about him. People murdered him. There was, there was, there was such, I can imagine that he must have felt like those owners of those homes when he opened the door and went inside and found that Satan had been in here and messed up this beautiful place that I have created. So what did Jesus do? What Jesus did is he went in the house and did an inspection. And he said, this house has to be redone. I have to redo this earth. And so when Jesus, listen to me, when Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, what he was doing was he was serving an eviction notice on Satan. And he got a piece of paper like this that says eviction notice from heaven to the devil. You must leave this property immediately. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Signed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he put that eviction notice. He put that eviction notice on the earth. And he says, I'm leaving for a few days, but I'm coming back. And when I come back, if you're still here, I'm getting you out of here. And one day soon, the trumpet's going to sound, and Jesus is coming back, and he's going to take that old slew fit, that old serpent, and he's going to bind him in chains, and he's going to cast him into outer darkness. Hallelujah. And he's going to live again in this earth, and he's going to fix it up, and he's going to recreate it. Eviction notice has already been served. Praise God. God's going to have to renew it. And so he's going to renew. He's going to renew the earth. He's going he's to dis, just destroy everything on the surface of this earth, and he's going to rebuild it all over again. And then he's going to bring us, his children, to live in this new earth. And heaven, the new Jerusalem, is coming down to the earth. So what's, people say, what's the new earth going to be like? Well, the Bible gives us little glimpses here and there, but not a whole lot. We have stories of the millennial kingdom with Jesus reigning. We have, we have glimpses like in Revelation 21 and 22. But here's the way I answer that question. When people say, what's the new earth going to be like? What's it going to be like to live here? And my answer is simply this. It's going to be like this earth, but much better. Let me ask you, have you ever had a chance to, to, to travel across the United States and see what a beautiful country we live in? Have you seen the rocky coast of Maine? Have you stood on top of one of the smoky mountains and looked out at the blue grass and the hue? Have you driven across the prairies and seen the wind blow the grass as far as you can see like waves of water? Have you stood in the majestic rocky mountains and seen the glacial lakes? Have you been to the sugar sands of Pensacola Beach, Florida? <laughs> or the white sands of New Mexico? Have you viewed the Grand, the grand uh, uh, Canyon? And its vastness, there's a lot of beauty here, isn't there? Or have you had a chance to even travel to other parts of the world? And some of you have. Have you seen the Swiss Alps and how beautiful they are? Have you been to the beautiful, royal, majestic, blue Caribbean waters? Have you maybe been to the Barrier Reef in Australia? Or, or, or maybe the, the sands of the Gobi Desert in Mongolia? There are places as you travel around this world and you say they're so beautiful. Have you ever seen a beautiful orange fiery sunset at night? Have you ever watched a flying fish glide across the surface of the water? Have you ever watched an otter play in a mountain stream? Have you ever seen a sunrise on the ocean when it was smooth as glass? It's beautiful. And if there's that kind of beauty, 
in this earth that is so messed up and on a downward spiral and so full of darkness, if there's that kind of beauty now, imagine how it's going to be when God recreates it and there's no curse and no sin and no death and no destruction. That's what's coming for us. That's the third home of Jesus. And guess what? We get to live there. But that's not even the best part. The best part is this. And we didn't read this in our text. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 3, John says that I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, Look, God's dwelling. Where is he? He's in heaven. His throne is in heaven. He's in the, in the New Jerusalem, right? God's dwelling place is come down. John said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to the earth as a bride adorned for its bridegroom. And he said, it is now among the people and he will dwell with them and be their God and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. The greatest thing is that the new Jerusalem is coming to the earth and we are going to live with Jesus forever and ever in our new bodies, in our new earth, in the new heavens, in the new Jerusalem and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. I am looking forward to that third home. The musicians will come. The Bible says in Revelation 21 that God will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there'll be no more death. And there'll be no more mourning or crying or pain for the former things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making, there's the creator, always making, right? I am making all things new. Stand with me, please. <laughs> oh, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be so wonderful. Everything in the curse is going to be reversed. It's going to be gone. A new heaven, a new earth. You're going to have a new body. It's going to be the same body, but it's going to be a different body. It's going to be the same earth, but it's going to be a different earth. It's going to be the same Jerusalem, but it's going to be a, a different Jerusalem. It's going to be better. It's going to be forever. But listen. What happens at the second coming of Christ for you will depend on what happened in the first coming of Christ. You may have missed the first coming of Christ. You don't want to miss the second coming of Christ. Because the Bible says that those who were not prepared at his second coming were left behind. You're either going to enjoy the glory and the splendor of the new heaven and the new earth forever, or you're going to burn in the flames of judgment. The choice is yours. And First Peter goes on in our text to say, God doesn't want anybody to perish. He is waiting patiently. The last verse I read said that, remember that God's patience is for salvation. He's waiting. He's waiting. And I wonder this morning, is he waiting for you? Are you one of the ones that he's waiting for before he comes back? Are you one of the ones that's been running from him? Maybe you're watching online right now and God's speaking to you. I'm going to tell you, heaven is so beautiful and hell is so hot that you don't want to miss the second coming of Jesus. Peter says this is how we ought to live. Holy lives, pure lives of righteousness, looking unto and hastening the appearing of Jesus a second time. Are you living that kind of life? You heard me beginning at the beginning of the sermon. The first message I had this morning was that Satan wants to distract us. 
and while he's got us distracted, Jesus comes and you missed it. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, just like that, it's a lightning strike from the east to the west. Bam! Jesus is going to come. You won't have time to pray. You won't have time to say, oh God, I see you coming. I'm, forgive me. Forgive me. I'm ready. I'm... No, no, no. It'll be too late. When the trumpet sounds in the moment, in the twinkling of as fast as you can blink your eye. Christians who are ready are going out of here. We're leaving this earth. So God can bring judgment and recreate it. And then we're going to come back in the third home and live with him forever. But you ain't leaving this home, friends, if you're not right with Jesus. That's why he said, make sure in our text you are at peace with him. Are you at peace with God? Bow your heads with me, Father. We get so distracted at Christmas time. <laughs> this would be a great time for Jesus to come back in the devil's eyes. We get distracted with money and presents and family issues and stress. And our schedule is full. But all along, you're calling us to keep our eyes on you, to live our lives for eternity, not for the here and now, but for eternity's sake, and to know that you are coming back. Your first coming was just part one, and if we just talk about the first coming of Jesus, we're only telling half the story. You came the first time so that we could come the second time. You made a way for us for salvation from the judgment and the curse of sin and death. You made a way for us. We sang the song, you're the way maker. You made a way for us. But there are people in this room this morning who are not ready for your second coming. The Holy Spirit, this is your work right now. I just did my job of proclaiming your word but now holy spirit you are working in hearts this morning and calling them to you so i ask you right now holy spirit right now just to go in these cameras go in the internet go in this building right now holy spirit speak to hearts draw them to you let them know there may not be a christmas this year jesus could come back are you ready? Are you ready? Every head bowed, please. Everybody quiet. Nobody leave. Just, just a holy moment right now. Holy moment right now. Are you here and you'll say to me, Pastor Lane, the Holy Spirit is convicting me this morning. If Jesus Christ were to come back the second time tomorrow, I would not be ready. Is that you? If that's you, just slip up your hand right now. I want, I want to see who you are so I can pray for you. Is there anybody say, that's me? Thank you. I see that hand. Is there another hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Eight people at least that at least raise their hands. There's some of you watching online right now. You know God is speaking to you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right now because God has great things in store for you and the devil has distracted you with the cares of life. He has distracted you with stuff that doesn't matter. He has distracted you with things that are going to burn. You're so worried. You're so caught up on things that are not eternal. God brought you here this morning. He brought you here to hear this word this morning. He's trying to arrest your spirit. He's speaking to your heart. And you know it. You raised your hand. He's speaking to your heart. Because he loves you. And he doesn't want to see you burn. You're his son. You're his daughter. And he has prepared a mansion for you where he can live with you forever. 
but your ways are running from him instead of to him. And today you acknowledge that. Today you recognize that. And I'm going to ask you to do something really bold right now. You say, why do, why, do, why do preachers ask us to do this? So I believe Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father. And I want to know how serious you are this morning. If you are ready this morning to say to God, I'm going to get ready. I have stuff in my life I need to give to you. There's some things I need to make right. There's some sin. There's some stuff that's out of order in my life. And I need to, I need to prepare myself for the second coming of Jesus. I don't want to miss what God has for me. And I feel like right now, if he came, I would miss it. I would miss it. And I don't want to miss it. And I need God's grace. I need him to help me. If that's you this morning and you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to step out of that chair and come and stand right down in front of all these people this morning in front of heaven and make a statement and say, I of this day declare I need God's help. I want to put him first in my life. If that's you, come. If that's you, come. If that's you, come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. God sees. He knows our heart. Listen, you may have been a Christian following Jesus for 30 years, but there are things that the devil has put in your life that has distracted you from your walk with God. And you need to make sure that you're getting it right that you're at peace with God. There's some issues. Maybe you have some issues with God this morning, and you need to come. This altar call isn't just for sinners. This is for saints who are distracted. This is for saints who are living their lives for other things than God. Today, you need to get back. You need to get your focus back. You need to get your heart back. You need to get back to true north. You need to get your heart back where it needs to be. Come, leave your chair right now. Get down to this altar. If you can, get on your knees and begin to cry out to God. God, get me back. Take me back, back where I need to be. Get, Lord, don't let anything. Those of you in the altar, I want you to pray right now. Don't let anything come between you and me, God. There's no sin in my life. There's nothing in my life that I'm going to put. I don't want to miss what you have for me. I, I want to live with you forever. I don't want to miss your second coming. I want to be ready. I want to know my life isn't what it needs to be. God, help me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask the A-team if you would come and begin to pray for these in the altar. Just stand behind and put your hands on their shoulder. Begin to pray for them. Will you come? Begin to pray for them. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Worship team, I want you to sing. I'm not done. I'm not dismissing you yet. Will you sing? Will you sing? I want you to pray for those in the altar right now. This is serious business. Pray for them. They're serious with God. They came out here because they're serious with God. They're serious with God. Steve. My deacons, my elders, will come and help us pray. Help us pray, please. The showers on the So my heart is unconfessed. Jesus Christ, the hope of me. Where's your hope this morning? Where's your hope? Spirit, wake up this congregation. Wake us all up today. 
wake us all up today. Get our focus on you. Get our focus on souls. Why are we here? What we're about. Awaken us. Fall upon us. Fall upon us, Lord. Fall upon us, Lord, with your holy rain. would be on you that our eyes would be up you are our hope you are the blessed hope Paul said that it, the second coming of Jesus is the blessed hope the blessed hope you came the first time we're celebrating that but we really need to be looking forward to the second coming because that's the end of the story that's the completion of our joy so, Father, let every person in this room today leave and go into the world and make a difference. Let them bring light to darkness. Let them bring joy to sorrow. Let them bring hope to despair. Use them, fill them with your spirit, and change the world through them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I'll see you at 6 o'clock tonight for prayer. Sing us out.
mejor.